Hi everyone, my name is Alba Rivas. I am a developer advocate at Salesforce and today I'm going to talk about how to make the move from Aura to Lightning Web Components. I'm going to focus on the key points that a developer must understand to make that move successfully. And I'm going to use as an example an application from our sample gallery, Greenhouse App. So let's start. These are my contact details. In case that you have any questions, you can reach me on Twitter or you can write me an email if you prefer. And with that, let's go to our favorite slide, the forward looking statement slide. This slide is something that we include in the presentations because Salesforce is a publicly traded company and it means that you should make purchases based on the functionality that is generally available. But don't worry because everything that we are going to see today is generally available. So first I want to give uh, a quick introduction to Lightning Web Components. I want to explain why we decided to release this new framework being Aura uh, so recent, right? And the quick answer to that is because of web standards. Web standards have experienced a, a very quick evolution in the last years. If we take a look at this curve here, uh, we see that from 2014, uh, the curve starts becoming much more steep. This is because there are two organizations who have been working together very closely and very hard to um, standardize everything uh, related to web components. These are the Web Worldwide Web Consortium and the ECMAScript Technical Committee. By the way, Salesforce is part of this organization. And also the browser vendors have been working hard to adopt all those new standards, right? So now we have a um, landscape in which we are able to take advantage of um, many more br native browser APIs than those that we were able to use in 2014. As Lightning Web Components uses the native uh, browsers APIs, that means that uh, they are going to be much more performant. And not only that, because if you are a developer who learns Lightning Web Components, you are really learning standards and native browser APIs, which means that your skills are going to be transferable to any other JavaScript based technology. In addition to that, uh, what we do is that we uh, simplify the way in which Web Components are created. We add a thin layer on top of these um, Web Components APIs that uh, simplifies the code that you have to write to create Web Components. Um, that means that you are going to be much more productive creating Web Components as a developer. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but I, I published two videos on YouTube um, comparing the way in which you create web components using vanilla JavaScript and the way in which you create them with Lightning Web Components. And you are going to see that you, you, can, you save some lines of code by using Lightning Web Components and, um, and become uh, more uh, productive as a developer, right? Um, another uh, main uh, topic uh, regarding Lightning Web Components is that, well, you know that in Salesforce we have customers that use uh, varied uh, browsers, right? And sometimes we have to uh, make our applications run in browsers that are old, that don't support all those new web standards. What we do is that we compile the Lightning Web Component code and when uh, the code is running in an old browser, we provide an alternative um, feature or an alternative code that that browser is able to understand. So we make the components backwards compatible. And finally, uh, there is uh, something that uh, is interesting as well of Lightning Web Components, which is that they are 
portable. They can be used outside of the platform too. Why? Because they are based on web standards. They use the uh, native browser APIs and that's the reason it's very easy to take a component that you are using on the platform and use it outside of the platform, for example, on a uh, Heroku app, right? And this means portability. Well, with that, uh, let's go into our um, presentation. Let's start talking about um, which concepts an Aura developer needs to know to make the move to a LWC successfully. For that, we are going to use an app, a sample app. We have uh, many apps in our sample app gallery, and this app uh, was created um, some years ago uh, um, before 2014, I believe, uh, sorry, not before 2014, but on uh, 2014 when Aura was released, right? And uh, then it was rewritten into Lightning Web Components. So that's great because we have a repo with the Aura version and we have another repo with the Lightning Web Components version, which means that you can do the comparison side by side and take a look at the differences in the code. And that is what we are going to do today. Let me show you the app for a second. This is a, a fictitious real estate company app in which sales reps can look for properties. For example, they can say, okay, I want to just look for Victorian properties. <laughs> I don't think there are uh, many Victorian properties around me, but anyway, in Boston, it seems they are. And uh, I can filter by the number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms, whatever, right? Uh, then I can click on a property to see its details here on the, on the right-hand side. And there are uh, many more uh, features highlighted in the app, but we are going to focus on this specific page, right? The Property Explorer page. Concretely, we are going to take a look at the code of these three components. We will take a look at the code of property filters, the component in which we uh, write those, those filters to filter out the properties that appear on the list. We're going to take a look at the property type list component, which is the panel in which we show every uh, returned property. And this component uses an auxiliary child component, which is called property tile, to represent each individual property. Great. So first thing that you have to, to do when you start uh, working with Lightning Web Components. Lightning Web Components are not supported by the developer console, so you need to install an IDE locally in your machine. Um, the idea that we recommend to use is Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is, uh, is great, a great IDE. I use it all the time and it has great capabilities. You can install lots of extensions. But the main reason we recommend this IDE is because we have released a set of extensions that help you are working with Salesforce. These extensions give you auto-completion capabilities, uh, syntax highlighting capabilities. Uh, it's very, very easy to access the help, right? When you um, uh, hover um, uh, the components, the, for example, the learning based components. And it's also uh, very easy to execute Salesforce CLI commands because there are shortcuts that allow you to execute those commands with, with just one click. Um, second, if you are going to develop locally, right, you need a way to uh, deploy the files to your org or uh, retrieve the files from your org. For that, we recommend to use the Salesforce CLI. The Salesforce CLI works with any org. You can use it with sandboxes, also uh, with scratch orgs, and um, even uh, production orgs, right? So this is a great tool to use. It has uh, also great features. If you are using with, if you are working with sandboxes, and now with a pilot also in sandboxes, you, you have something called source tracking. And source tracking is going to detect 
automatically the differences between your or and your local environment and you don't have to keep remembering what you change and many more features that are going to make you much more productive. Um, if you are um, uh, debugging your Lightning Web components in your org, it is recommended that you uh, set up the debugging configuration in your org. Here I leave you a link to a blog post in which we explain very well the different steps that you have to follow to be able to conf to, to debug in your org, right? And normally we, we do that with the Chrome developer tools, but you could use also Firebook or another um, another tool, right? And finally, there is something else I want to mention, which is our local development server. The local development server is a um, uh, Salesforce CLI plugin that uh, you install locally and it allows you to uh, develop and debug your Lightning Web components locally without the need to be uh, pushing them or pulling uh, to, to, an or, to or from an org. Right. The local development server also, um, you, you normally bind your local copy of the code to an OR and it allows you to bring some sample data so that when you have a component that uh, shows uh, Salesforce data, for example, a record form component, uh, the component uh, shows that sample data locally. So I recommend you to take a look as well because it's very um, useful. Great. So once we have set up our development environment, then um, we will have to start creating Lightning Web components. And for that, we are going to start taking a look at the differences. The first difference that we are going to take a look at are the components files, the files that shape your Lightning Web component. And for that, we're going to take a look at the property tile component, as this is the simplest component that we have on the app. This is the code for the component. What I have done is that I have copied here in a folder the Aura code and in another folder the Lightning Web Components code. In the Aura version, we had the component file, right? Then we have a controller, we could have a helper, a renderer, JavaScript files, right? The CSS and the metadata file. In Lightning Web Components, the files are going to be similar, but we are going to uh, be much more standard than we were in Aura. If you, if you uh, notice here, uh, the CMP file equivalent is the HTML file. The eight, sorry, it's open here. Let me go back and show the CMP file. Yeah, so this is the HTML file. And if we compare the HTML file with the CMP file, we can see that it's much more standard, right? As, uh, to start, uh, it ends up in HTML as regular HTML files. We are using here a standard tags. Template is also a standard tag, right? And we are using a standard web components. We will talk a bit more about that later. Um, the size of the file gets reduced a bit because we have moved some of these aura attributes and event registration to the JavaScript file. And the JavaScript file, um, if, you, if, you, if you take a first look to it, you can think that is uh, quite different, but really it's not, right? Because these methods here are going to become uh, methods in your uh, JavaScript file. But what happens is that again, we're becoming much more standard. Instead of using a custom structure, we are using an ECMAScript 6 class. This is a standard, a standard JavaScript class to define the component behavior. Instead of um, using uh, attributes, we are going to use properties, which are instance variables of that class. And uh, many more standard things that we will see during the talks. This import and export keywords, for example, means that we are using ES6 modules. 
And that's the way we share JavaScript code between, between one component and another component. And uh, in summary, everything that we will use here is a standard JavaScript. And finally, we have the metadata file. Uh, obviously, uh, we can have also a CSS file and um, SVG file for, for the icon on a builder, but uh, those are more or less the same. And the metadata file is kind of different because the metadata file that we have in Lightning Web Components is much more versatile. And I'm going to show you that in the slides. In the metadata file is where you configure everything that relates to Salesforce. So um, if you want to make your component available for a specific Salesforce page, you're going to configure that in the metadata file instead of using interfaces as you do in Word. For example, you can define a target, which is a lightning record page, a page, etc., etc., etc. Design attributes are also defined in the metadata file, the ones that um, help you indicate values in a builder, right? And why do I say it's much more versatile? Because we have more granularity on uh, the way in which we define these targets and these design attributes. For example, I could say that I want the component to be available for lightning record pages, but only for the account object. And I could do exactly the same for a design attribute. So just bear in mind that if you make the move uh, from uh, Aura to LWC, that's something that you can consider. Great. So. Next thing that we're going to take a look are properties. Properties is the, uh, are the replacement for attributes. And let me go again to the property type code. Sorry, not here. And we're going to take a look at what uh, property means. So in our property type component, I'm going to close this because I don't need it anymore. We had an attribute here. The attribute stores a property object. It's something that we will retrieve from the backend at some point and pass it uh, to pass it down to this component. And uh, we were defining that in the CMP file. In Lightning Web Components, in contrast, we will define attributes as properties and or instance variables of the a component class. Normally, you don't need to use this API keyword, right? This is a decorator, which is something that we will uh, explain later. But just by defining the property here is not a very good name for this property because this is the property property. But I hope that you understand what I mean with uh, property. Just by defining that, you can access the property in the markup in the same way that we were doing in Aura, right? In Aura, we were able to access, for example, a field address from the property. And now we are able to access what well, this, this has changed slightly, but here we have the city, for example, and we can access um, the same property in the markup uh, with a, a simplified syntax. Um, another way to define properties is using a getter. Getter is a concept that also exists in other programming languages. And a getter is no more than a way to define a property, but executing some logic every time that that property is get. Right. So uh, in this case, every time that we reference the background image style property, the uh, code will compute this value here. Getters are a great replacement for markup expressions. In Aura, we were able to use markup expressions and compute some values on the CMP file like this. And in Lightning Web Components, we are not allowed to do that anymore. 
Why? Because we want all your business logic to be testable. We want to um, make it easy to test our business logic. And having the business logic in the um, in the markup is, is not the best practice and is not going to be easy to test. That's the reason markup expressions need to be replaced by getters. And optionally, of course, you could define a setter for this property. So, properties, um, most properties are reactive. This is the same than in Aura. In Aura, if you change the value of an attribute on the JavaScript controller, for instance, then the component is going to be re-rendered to show the new value, right? The same is going to happen in Lightning Web Components. If I change the value of this property here, the component is going to re-render. Or if I change the value of the thumbnail uh, here, the component is going to re-render as well because the getter is going to compute any value for my background image style. However, there is a small difference and that's something to bear in mind. Not all the properties are reactive. There are two specific use cases in which properties are not reactive by default, but you have the control and you can make them reactive. And that is what I'm going to explain in the next slide. These are the two cases, right? The first case is when your property holds an array of items and you want the array to be reactive to changes in the items of the array. For example, when you insert a new item or you remove an item, right? Those um, changes are not going to be observed by default. And if you want them to be observed, you will have to make annotate the property with track, same as we did with API, with the add API, but with track. The second case is when you have a property, which is an object, and you want to make to, to make the component react and re-render when a field of that property changes, a field of that object. In that case, in that case, uh, the property won't be reactive by default, and you need to use track if you want to make it reactive. We have designed it that way for performance because obviously it's expensive for the framework to track all those um, high depth uh, level changes, right? So in summary, if you have our attributes, then you will have to move that to properties on the JavaScript file. If you have markup expressions, you will have to change that to a getter. And finally, consider reactivity when migrating our attributes, because in these two situations, you may have to use track. It's that simple. Okay, great. So now we are going to take a look at composition. Let me see if I'm okay with the time. Yes, I am. Perfect. So um, a good uh, example of composition is this component here, right? We have our property tile list and we are using our auxiliary property tile component to uh, represent every individual house. So this is a child component. We are going to perform an iteration over the houses that are returned by the backend. And we are going to use this auxiliary component. We are going to compose the page with this auxiliary component. So we are going to take a look at the code of these two components. Great, so first, this is the code for the property tile component. If we take a look at the ORA code, we not notice here that we were doing an ORA iteration. You will be familiar with this. We were iterating over an array of properties, which was an attribute, right? This attribute here. And uh, on every iteration, we were instantiating the property tile component, the auxiliary one. How were we passing the information of the house down to that component? By using, setting this attribute, right? We were um, 
doing the binding of uh, the uh, property that we are that is part of the iteration and we were passing that down to a property attribute that was defined on the child component that was in order luckily in uh, lining web components is very similar right um, iterations it's very easy to replace iterations because they are done in the same way we have a markup directive the uh, syntax is slightly different, but uh, the mechanism is the same. And the ha same happen for conditional statements, right? We, for or if, we have a template if true and template if false. You will find more information about that in the documentation. Then, what do we do? We iterate over uh, our properties array we will see later because we have this .data records, right? It's because of the way in which we uh, retrieve uh, that information from the backend. And then we instantiate the property child auxiliary component as many times as houses we have in that array. The syntax is slightly different. In Aura, we used namespace, colon, and the name of the component in camel case. And now we use a syntax called kebab case. It's like a kebab roll in horizontal position. That's the reason it's called kebab case. And why do we use the kebab case? Because it's the standard way in which um, the standards, the web standards recommend to, to write uh, components, custom components and standard components, right? I'm sure you haven't seen um, a standard HTML tag that is written on camel case. So um, the way in which we pass the information down is pretty similar, much, sim much simpler, because we, we don't have to, to use the V notation or the exclamation mark or whatever, right? Or the hash, if we wanted to, to do just unidirectional data binding. And we pass it to a property that is defined on the child component. So let's take a look now at the uh, property child component again. This is the property to which we are passing that value down, right? But in order to do that, we need the property to be public. And for that, what we use is a decorator, the API decorator, right? The API, well, decorators are imported from the LWC module right and then you can use it with add api they are very common also in other uh, programming languages i had used them for example in python and decorators um, can decorate entities here we are decorating a property but they could be decorating a method as well and you decorate it just by prepending the the decorator to the property we could write it this way as well we will see an example later of um, a use case in which we write decorators this way. That just means that the decorator is adding some functionality to the decorated entity somehow, right? And in this case, we are uh, marking it as public. Great. So uh, we have seen how we can compose component and how we pass information down. Um, sorry, this is first, this is a summary of how to replace markup directives. We saw an example in the code of how to replace an or iteration, but there is also uh, another uh, markup directive to replace or if expression. Uh, this is an example of uh, how to change the syntax when you reference another component, a child component. And the same occurs with uh, lining base components. Um, by the way, uh, there is a guide in the developer guide that explains very well how to replace Aura components by its lining web component equivalent or so equivalent solution, right? And something that not many people know is that lining web components uh, that are base components are 
open source. Not all of them, but a big portion of them. So for example, if you want to take a look at how the Lightning Accordion is implemented, you can go to this repo here and take a look. And if you want to make a few tweaks and implement your own version, you can do that as well. Great. So this is what I was trying to say before. We have seen how to compose components and pass uh, information down using a property, right? That we annotated with API on the child. And we're going to see now how to pass information up uh, to the par to a parent component. In, the, in our app, let me show you again. When are we passing information up? when we click on one of the tiles. Why? Because uh, every time that we click on one of the tiles, the property tile component is sending a kind of component event to the outer component, to the property tile list component, and the property tile list component in turn is publishing an application event that is making these components here to update. So now we are going to take a look at the bit of the event, the component event that property tile communicates to its direct parent, property tile list component. And we are going to see that, well, uh, first, I'm going to, to explain you something, which is that um, in Aura, the way to pass information down, uh, you could do that in two different ways, right? One way was uh, using bidirectional data binding. Uh, that means that, for example, here on the child, you were able to change the value of a property and that change was propagated to the parent, right? But that was a bit confusing because the information had like two different flows and we uh, started recommending to use the second approach when, when uh, at, at the beginnings of Aura, right? Which is using events. Events is a way, is a way of passing information down up that we, you could do in Aura, but also um the only way in which you can pass information up in lightning web components we are going to fire an event on the child on the child and we are going to subscribe or to um uh, sorry create a handler for that event on the parent to listen to it so now we are going to take a look at how this example of I'm clicking on the property tile and I send an event up, it was implemented in Aura and how it's implemented in Lightning Web Components. It happens that in Aura, it was implemented using the, um, the best practice, right? Using events. Um, we were firing an event, but these events were something Aura proprietary. It was not, uh, you had to create the event as a metadata type, and then it was not something standard that would work in any um, JavaScript uh, application, right? Now, what we do is that we use a standard DOM events. A standard DOM events are created, uh, well, there are some standard ones, and if you want to create a custom one, you have to use this interface. If you Google for it, you are going to find a lot of information because this is a standard JavaScript um, API, right? You uh, define the name that you want the event to have, and then the payload that you want it to carry up, and then you dispatch the event. Um, the way to listen to the event, for that we go to the property tile list component, is defining a handler. So handlers can define in a static or dynamic way, but um, just as this talk is for beginners, just, let's just focus on the static way. The static way would be that I say, okay, as I know that this component is dispatching an event, I'm going to say that when that event, remember that I call my event selected, unselected, I'm going to, I want to execute um, the code of this method here. This method is defined on the JavaScript file. Here, under property selected. And the 
method is going to refine uh, to receive the event as a parameter and then I will be able to access to the event payload inside uh, the body of my method. And here we are doing something else, but let's don't worry about that for now. Great, so we have seen how to pass information down and up. This is a summary of what we just did, right? If we pass information down, we need to define an API property on the child and set the value on the parent. If we need to send the information up, we need to fire a standard on event and listen to the event, to the event on the parent. And the event could even propagate to uh, more parents components in the, in the component chain, right? So basically, if you had an aura attribute used to pass information down, you will have to convert that to an API property. If you had an aura attribute to pass information up, you will have to convert that into uh, an event. You will have to, to move to the event pattern because it's the standard one uh, that um, uh, is uh, supported in uh, regular uh, JavaScript applications. And if you have uh, had aura component events, you will have to convert that into a standard DOM events. Very easy. Right, so um, in our application, I uh, said that uh, there is a situation, which is when, when I click on one of the tiles, in which um, an application event needs to be fired in Aura because the uh, other uh, components on the page the page has been created with App Builder, obviously, need to listen to that component so that they can uh, update themselves and retrieve the correct information, right? There is another situation in which we use an application event uh, on the app, which is when we uh, write, uh, change the property filter components. When we write something on this search key field here or when we change the filters, an application event is being published to the app so that the property tile list component can subscribe to it and can bring the properties from the backend filtering by the uh, filter criteria that we have set, right? So now we're going to see how to replace those application events. Application events are replaced by a new technology that we have released called Lightning Message Service. Lightning Message Service is a framework that allows you to communicate components between each other when they are in different DOM hierarchies, as in our case, they are in different DOM hierarchies because we have created the page with a builder, but also allows to communicate Aura components with LWC components with Visual Force components. What we do with Lightning Message Service is that we create a, a, a channel. We have a new metadata type for that, Lightning Message Channel. And then any Aura LWC or Resource Force component is able to publish messages to the channel and also to listen to messages in the channel. So you can, a Visual Force component can listen to a message published by an Aura component, for instance. And this gives uh, much uh, more versatility to our applications. This would be the way to replace our application events. And we're going to take a look at how this application event is replaced by a message in the Lightning Message Service. We're going to take a look at Property Filter, which is the publisher, and we're going to uh, take a look at Property Tile List Component, which is the subscriber. Obviously, it could be uh, there could be much more, many more subscribers because um, it's a published subscribe model. So let's take a look at the, oh, sorry, uh, the uh, property filters component. Here we have the, the filters. This is the code for the filters. And this is the JavaScript file in which we have uh, written the code uh, to publish the event. And it's very easy to publish an event. Well, first we need to define, I, I, I don't have the, the code here, but uh, you need to define a message channel, which is a new metadata type. 
it's just defining this is the channel in I want in which I want to publish my messages that indicate that the filter has changed. That's it. And that is the channel that we will publish the messages to. Um, this message channel is imported at the top of the file. You can see here import from Salesforce message channel, etc. etc. And then uh, we can see some other entities being imported from the Lightning Message Service module, which are publish a message context. We will forget about message context uh, for today, but let's focus on how this method works. So basically, we are saying that we want to publish a message on this channel and that we want to um, uh, publish this specific message. The message is a plain JavaScript object in which we are setting the uh, values of the filters. And we are uh, calling this method every time that any of my filters change. If I change the slider for the price, this method is going to be called. If I change the uh, slider for the bedrooms, this method is going to be called as well. So we are publishing events constantly. If we take a look at the subscriber, which is the property tile list, subscriptions are normally performed on the connected callback. What is the connected callback? This is a life cycle hook. Uh, same as um, in Aura, you had mechanisms to hook on the different uh, moments of the life cycle, right? You were able to, uh, for example, write a renderer a JavaScript class to execute code when the uh, component was rendered. We have the same in Lightning Web Components. Life cycle hooks. The life cycle is a bit different, right? Um, it uh, propagates differently from child to parent that in Aura components and the life cycle hooks are, are a bit different. So I recommend you to um, try to pay attention to that and understand it in depth because that's something that you may need to change when making the move if you do a migration and also in your mind uh, for, for when you write new Lightning Web components if you come from an Aura background, right? But I'm not going uh, in depth uh, into this today because of, of the time as well. So what we do is uh, to use this hook, this code is going to be executed when the component is connected to the DOM and we are going to create a subscription. Again, we are going to subscribe to this channel. The channel is being imported here at the top. The subscribe um, method is being imported here at the top as well from the Lightning Message Service module. And uh, what we define here is what our code should do every time that a message is listened. Here we are saying that uh, we are defining a callback function that will call this method here every time that a message is listened. This method for now is storing uh, the values of the message payload in these properties that are properties defined uh, here at the top. And we will see later why uh, we do that. Um, by the way, uh, you are going to find um, uh, a slightly different syntax for uh, some uh, JavaScript structures in Lightning Web Components because we are use we, we do support ECMAScript uh, six to ECMAScript eight uh, or nine. I don't remember the the version. Uh, no, six, seven, eight, to nine. Yeah, uh, from ECMAScript six to nine uh, features that uh, were not supported in Aura. So in Aura, for example, you had to uh, write functions in the old way. And in Lightning Web Components, you can write uh, functions like this, which is the ECMAScript 6 syntax, but it's exactly the same. Once you, th there is a trailhead module, which is uh, called JavaScript Basics, that will explain to you all uh, those details. And that I recommend you to tackle um, at some point because uh, some things that you may think are uh, proprietary from Lightning Web Components are just a standard JavaScript. And of course, we have the JavaScript Developer One certification that you can take a look at. 
Uh, good. So there is just one last step missing, uh, which is to explain how the property child list component requests the uh, houses from the backend passing in the filter criteria that it has read from each message that it receives, right? So every time that a message is rece received, we are going to take uh, the filter criteria from there and we are going to call Apex. There are many ways to call Apex, but we are going to explain the one um, that is suitable for this specific use case. And I will talk a bit more later about the other ways. So let's go to our property tile code, property tile list, sorry. And I'm going to show you first the Apex method. The Apex method is this one here, great property list. It needs to be or enabled, same as in Aura. So it's very easy to reuse the, the methods that you had in Aura. And in this case, we are, oh, sorry, my, my, <laughs> my mouse uh, ran out of battery. Give me one second or I, I will use better this mouse, right? Um, okay, so uh, here we can see the cacheable um, um, attribute. The cacheable attribute is there because as we are reading data from the backend, just reading data, not modifying data, it makes sense that we uh, store the results from the server invocations in a client uh, side cache so that if uh, we need to execute exactly the same call, the same call sometime later, we can retrieve that data from the cache and avoid a server round trip, right? Um, right, so the method we import it here at the top of the file. Uh, Apex methods, you need to import them from Salesforce, Apex, and then the name of the class and the name of the method. Very easy. And then there are two ways to call the Apex methods. You can invoke them uh, one time, having the full control of the invocation, or you can create a service that will invoke the method under certain situations for you. You delegate the invocation of the, of the method to the service and the service is going to provide new values from time to time to, um, to a property or function that you annotate or decorate with the wire decorator, right? Again, this is a wire decorator and this is the syntax I mentioned before. Wire, uh, the decorator can be uh, prepended to the property or um, above the property. So how do we set up this uh, wire service? Well, first we pass in the Apex method and then uh, that we want the, the service to invoke, right? And then we pass the parameters that the Apex method is expecting, expecting the search key, the max price, etc., etc., etc. By using the dollar symbol here, what we are saying is that we want the service to provide new values every time that any of these properties change. That means that any time that in my JavaScript class I change the value of search key or max price or min bedrooms, whatever, 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 the wire service is going to provide a new value. The wire service is going to provide new value uh, from the server or from the cache. If the value is stored in the cache, as our method was cacheable, it will be provided from the cache, right? And those values that are provided by the wire service are going to be stored in the decorated property or is going, are going to be passed to uh, the decorated function. That's another uh, use case that we are not seeing here. Another case in which the wire service will provide new value is when uh, the value uh, or the response for a specific um, call changes in the cache. So uh, let's say that we had some properties annotated in the car on the cache, but that 
Somehow, this has been refreshed because a new property has been created in the system. In that case, the wire service is going to provide new values as well. Now, the properties that are annotated with wire are uh, reactive. That means that every time that we have new values here, the HTML page is going to refresh. And that means that every time that we receive new values, um, all this iteration is going to run again and to render the uh, correspondent property tiles. These data.records that I mentioned before is uh, there because this is the format in which the wire service uh, returns the properties, right? It's, it's a, a bit more complex structure because um, it can include errors as well and more information about the, the wire service uh, operation. And finally, there is just uh, one bit uh, missing that I want to, to show you, which is the glue that uh, sticks uh, the um, lightning message service code that we saw before with this code here, which is the way in which we um, um, react to the filter change message that is published constantly every time that we change the filter criteria on the, on the event uh, channel. Right, the, what we do uh, when we when a property, oh, sorry, no, 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 is handle filter change, not, the, not that one, is this one here, right? Remember, so what we do in that case is that we uh, store the uh, values that come in that message in these properties and, and, and as those properties change, what is going to happen? That the wire service is going to react to those changes and automatically is going to bring new values to my properties. It's super easy, uh, super clean. Uh, you delegate the invocation to the service and you don't have to worry about invoking Apex ever more, <laughs> right? So I hope that you saw the beauty of this uh, new feature that we have in Lightning Web Components and the uh, benefits of using it. Great. So I said before that we are uh, we I have shown to you this specific uh, way of working with Salesforce data, uh, calling Apex using wire. Uh, we used that approach because we are reading multiple records and that's the um, suggested way to go. But there are many ways in which you can work with Salesforce data. You can use Lightning for components. You can use the Lightning data service uh, directly uh, with wire adapters and with wire functions. Well, and this is really a big topic. It's very important that all the developers understand very well the different tools that we have to work with Salesforce data because um, the recommended solution in every individual case is, uh, is going to be different. I mean, uh, you can always uh, call Apex imperatively for everything, but then you are not going to be getting the benefits of the other solutions that imply a far less code and that uh, probably are going to be more performant because they are using um, the Lightning Data Service cache and other um, um, performance improvement mechanisms, right? I'm not going to explain this, but there is a trailhead module uh, about Lightning Web Components and Salesforce data. I wrote those, uh, that module, so if you have questions, you can ask me as well. And also, there is a webinar I did um, about how to work with Salesforce data in which I spent an hour talking about this. The webinar was a part of a series called Visual Force to LWC. Uh, but I don't focus too much on the visual force part and I think the webinar is going to be helpful also for all other developers, not just for visual force developers. There are some other key concepts that uh, you should take a look as Aura developers and not going into the details today, but it's interesting uh, for you to know as uh, these three topics that I wanted to mention because not everybody knows. Well, first of all, um, if you have an application built with Aura, 
uh, a question that many developers have is, should I migrate the application? And the answer is, uh, no, by default, unless you have a component which is especially low performant, you shouldn't because there are, spe there are a specific and great integration mechanisms between Aura and Lightning Web components. We have seen one of them, which is the Lightning Message Service, but Aura components can also include Lightning Web components. So for instance, if you have an Aura component which is working fine and you want to extend a specific bit of functionality, you can write that new bit in Lightning Web components and then uh, include it in your, your Aura component. So I think that's a, a really great approach. And also you can share JavaScript code between Aura and Lightning Web components. You can um, store that code into a Lightning Web component and share it between Aura and LWC. So that can help you extend your applications that are already written in Aura. And finally, in what regards to unit testing, we uh, recommend to use Jest. Jest is a framework same as Mocha or Jasmine, but uh, we released a plugin for Jest that uh, helps testing Lightning Web components very easily because we provide uh, mocks for Lightning-based components and we also provide a way of mocking the wire service, for instance, and other things. You have many examples in our uh, applications on the sample app gallery because they all have unit tests. So please take a look if you, if you can. Finally, I wanted to um, talk about uh, this benchmark that um, was done when the uh, Dreamhouse app was migrated to Lightning Web Components. This may not be uh, up to date because it is a blog post that was published uh, a year or two years ago, but a year ago uh, it was uh, evident the improvement in performance that we had in the different pages of uh, Dreamhouse by making the move to Lightning Web Components. So if you have another component which has low performance, this is something that you can consider. Great, with that we have arrived to the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for being there and for listening. Here I leave you some links. Right? The first one is uh, the one uh, to our sample gallery in which you are going to find Dreamhouse, but also many other apps that uh, he will help you understand the best practices with Lightning Web Components. Then I leave you some links that I have mentioned during the talk. And uh, the only one that I haven't mentioned is this one here, which is a trail that we have in Trailhead, which is exclusively about Lightning Web Components. And from there, you are going to be able to access that uh, JavaScript basics module that I mentioned, the Lightning Web Components basics, the Lightning Web Components and Salesforce data one, and many more. So I recommend you to go to Trailhead and get your hands on because you know that that's the best way to learn. Thank you so much. And I hope that you enjoyed the talk. Bye bye.